we did see the same thing again on the COT report here. We look at the swap dealers added 7,900 shorts, sold 2,000 longs. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. And once again, joined by Andy Schechtman as we take a look inside the physical silver market, other issues affecting the silver market, certainly the gold rally. And also nice to be commenting on a silver rally as well, because it seemed like silver was finally getting a little bit more involved in the nice direction of prices in the past week. So we'll dig into that little commentary on the Fed meeting coming up. By the time you're watching this, it'll be one day away. We're recording Monday afternoon, but with all that said, Andy, it's great to be back here with you as always. How are you doing today, sir? I'm good, my brother. Good to be back with you too. Thanks for having me, Chris. Well, why don't we dig right into silver because obviously we've seen gold. I mean, we've seen both of the metals rallying over the past couple of weeks, but silver really had its first bigger day back on Thursday when it was up almost a dollar. Now at 25.26 as of Monday afternoon. And again, as many people are familiar, we've had this $26 level that has been the top end of the range over the past couple of years. Of course, while this move has been happening, leaving the price closer to 26, We've also seen a buildup of the bank short positions, which we will touch on as well. But Andy, I'll let you take it from there. Any thoughts on seeing silver finally catching up a little bit with gold? Yeah, I mean, it's it's about time, and that's usually the way it happens. Gold leads the way. Silver then catches up on a percentage basis and typically outperforms it. But to me, one of the things that really needs to be talked about is that over 1,200 tons of silver that have stood for delivery this year, you know, you put that on top of the... 76 million ounces that that India took possession of in February, popping their numbers up to, I think, over 400 million ounces in the last two years, which coincides pretty darn close with the amount of silver that's been bled off of, of Comex. All of these things are starting to come together. But at the same time, we see the silver market in Shanghai really damn close to 28 bucks an ounce. So what is the real price? It is, is it the make-believe price on the LBMA and on the Comex, or is it the ever slightly increasing arbitrage friendly price that we see in Shanghai of nearly $28 an ounce? So it's, it's you know, this is one of these deals where, again, you look at silver, I do anyway, and look at it from a fundamental position. Chris, at, at 26 bucks just seems ridiculously cheap when you uh, look at it from an inflation adjusted position, when you look at it in terms of its supply demand fundamentals. When you look at it in just about every single metric, an asset that is decreasing in nature, that is increasing in demand on many different levels, uh, I I think it's it's hard to ignore it. And then when you see, you know, even on the LBMA, they're down to 814 million ounces. That that's the lowest it's it's ever been, and of which 60 to 70 percent of it belongs to you know, to the ETFs or the Bank of England. So the majority of everything that they have for delivery. On the LBMA is either already owned or encumbered, or you know um, we're down to the scraps. So this is becoming very interesting. And and as China continues to crank up the arbitrage uh, heat, this will be something that I want to talk about here in a moment or two as we get deeper into this conversation. What's going on with the pricing uh, and the demand? But yeah, I think it to me. I don't care how if the commercial banks are are lining up on the on the short side right now, if that's what you're getting at. The bottom line to me is that, that you know, to be short this market, especially naked short, silver, in an environment where you have massive bleed downs in inventory, where you have arbitrage going on across the globe, where you have countries like India standing for huge amounts of delivery, taking possession of it, uh, it's, very, it's as dangerous and stupid as a mud wall. So it's just a matter of time before silver finally accentuates itself and finally gets to a price that would resemble something that, you know, is fair. And I think we're still a long ways away from it. So, yeah, it's nice to see it gain some strength. But even with that being said, I think we're well below where it should be. Look, just take the price right now of gold at 2160 bucks and divide it by 
42, which would be the average price of the last 150 years, the price relationship, that's $51.40. That's where it should be today based upon the last 150 years worth of price ratio. But it's coming out of the ground at 7 to 1. So take 2150 and divide it by 7, you get $307. If you told me it was 300 bucks tomorrow morning, I wouldn't be surprised, and nor would I think that that's outrageous based upon its geologic relationship with uh, with, with gold. So yeah, I mean, 50 bucks wouldn't be too expensive, nor would 300 or anything in between. So as we see it move up little by little by little, yeah, it, it's long overdue. And I think um, there's a lot of, of road left to, to who expect silver to outperform and to appreciate um, as time goes on, as we get closer to, uh, you know, the elections get closer to the BRICS meetings, I expect to see more of this continue. Yeah, and interesting, I'll pull this back up when we take a look at the gold chart. You see in there, copper hits 11-month high, which obviously some similarities in trading to silver. And here we can see that 11-month high looking back one year. And again, copper uh, had, had a similar dynamic in the, the period during the great financial crisis and um, has followed the silver chart somewhat closely over the past couple of years. And Andy, uh, with everything that you said in there, one thing that I will toss in as a variable and get your comment on, we talked about it a bit last week, but certainly we did see the same thing again on the COT report. Here we look at the swap dealers added 7,900 shorts, sold 2,000 longs, and you can see the managed money doing the opposite of that. Similar pattern in gold here, swap dealers adding shorts and subtracting longs big increase in the managed money. So I get what you're saying. And also in terms of supply and demand and things like that. And, and we did see that big Indian number. There's Reliant Industries in India that is building a 20 gigawatt solar factory. And yet in terms of the day-to-day, -day, that doesn't always reflect immediately. So thoughts on what you see here with the once again the increase in the the banks shorting it's annoying as hell and it's old already and and it's the rinse wash and repeat and this is one of the reasons why what i'm about to mention uh with the related to the BRICS new currency it will end very poorly and i and i can all but guarantee that in a world of in a world of no guarantees, to me, it's it's almost a, a no-brainer when when I read to you what I'm about to read to you. But I think that this is is not lost on the rest of the world. And look, there's a reason why the Chinese bought the LME, the London Metals Exchange, which was primarily base metals like copper, as you mentioned, and others. Um, and you know, if you look at the fact that China uh, that that China just canceled a bunch of um, um, I think they were soybean or corn contracts with U.S. farmers. Why they're buying them from Brazil now and, and paying for it in yuan, which is immediately convertible into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. At the same time, the BRICS now have just developed or ha are going to develop a BRICS grain exchange. And the BRICS grain exchange is a pushback to the fact that all of the global prices of these commodities are primarily settled on the Chicago Mercantile or the Commodity Exchange. And you know, when you listen to what they're saying, they say the ministry insists that the BRICS countries are the largest grain producers and exports, but have no leverage to influence the price of agricultural commodities critical for their food security. So what are they doing? They're building the BRICS grain exchange. So this is similar to what I'm about to bring up to you with what's going on with um, with precious metals. But when you look at what they're doing, look, they bought the LME, they're gonna warehouse metals that are listed on the LME in China. They're the biggest producers of half of the, the, the industrial metals and the rare earth metals and all of the precious metals. And, and, and they produce as much grain or more so than the West. These are the countries that are the ones producing and accumulating and appreciating the commodities for what they represent. And they have been subservient really to the Western price mechanism and the whims of, of, of the ups and the downs and the shorting and the sucking and the speculating and then smashing it down again, like we're seeing right here with the increase in the swap dealers short position. It's annoying already, but if, if you take a step back and look at it for what it really is, uh, I think there's a hell of an opportunity here. And, and let me just jump ahead. I know this isn't what you asked me, but 
because it fits like a hand in glove and it's really very important. I, I know you had a big scoop today. So well, I'll it's it, to me, it's to one it. of the most important things that that I could mention. And I and a lot of it I've been talking about, right? I, I've been saying for a long time that the Shanghai Gold Exchange or the Moscow Metals Exchange or the exchange for metals in Dubai at some point would take over for the fraudulent LBMA and the fraudulent COMEX, where exactly these kinds of things can happen. Um, where the price is is controlled and or really um, representative of the futures price rather than the underlying commodity. It's the tail wagging the dog. So, you know, there's been this this talk about a new currency, and we, we talked about it for the last few years, and a lot of people were bummed out when they didn't come out with their currency in, in August in, in Johannesburg, and we've talked at length about how instead they've been trading in in local currencies, just like Brazil paying uh, or, or accepting yuan for their corn. Brazil is, after all, the second largest exporter of corn in the world or producer of it. And so now they take yuan, and if they want to hold it, great, or maybe they convert it into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange and take possession of it because gold is tier one, and gold has been accumulated by the central banks at a faster pace than ever. All of these things are coming together. We see that. So there's a man, uh, there's a there's a, a website that I, a news agency that I go to a lot. It's called TASS, T-A-S-S. -S, and it's a it's a Russian news site. And actually, I find that it's on par in many cases with Zero Hedge. You get really good information that is 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 um it's confirmed by the Western media, but usually several days later. In any any case, they came out with uh, uh an interview done by a a man named uh, Yuri Yushavkov, where he did admit. Everything that we've been talking about, he said that there's going to be, they're working on a new digital currency, right? And digital currency would be based off the technology of the project M-Bridge. And the M-Bridge is, is a, a, a technology, I think it was designed by, by China, by Singapore, and the United Arab Emirates. And it's a way for these countries to trade their digital currencies across border without using the SWIFT system. And they have done some trades recently using the Umbridge, a couple of the, maybe it's called the Genesis trade. A few of the first trades have been done over the last few weeks on the project Umbridge. So in any case, they came out and they, he came out and said that the idea of the currency will be based upon two baskets. And the first basket will be a mix of local currencies of the countries that, that are represented in, in the BRICS nations. And the second would be a basket of commodities. Now, we've been saying that forever. Why? Because Glazyev, the, the Russian finance minister, has been saying that for three years or nearly, and it made great sense. In fact, I think we were talking about this long before he came out and said that. It just became obvious when we saw the massive amount of, of central bank repatriation of gold and accumulation of it, its tier one revision. We knew that gold would have a footprint in something that was coming on the scene for a new system. Well, Glazyev uh, uh, confirmed it a couple of years ago, and here we have it again. He said, yes, a basket of local currencies and uh, a basket of commodities. Now, here's where it gets interesting, right? We have a digital currency using the Project Embridge technology, sidestepping the SWIFT system, backed in local currencies of the BRICS nations and commodities. Everything we have said fits that. But here is where it gets interesting. And I have said this, I've been begging people to understand that what is happening with the arbitrage on the Shanghai exchange, what is happening with the, the development of the Moscow exchange, what is happening around the globe is that they are aware of what we're doing. They are, are aware that we have been suppressing the markets for a long time to support the illusion of the strength of the bond market, the strength of the Western system. And I have argued for a long time, they're using it against us. The jiu-jitsu move, I've said it a million times, using our leverage against us. Now listen to what this man had to say. He said, the second part is price. For the moment, price is determined by Western speculation. We produce these commodities, we consume them, but we do not have our own price mechanism, which will balance supply and demand. During the COVID pandemic, the price of oil fell to nearly zero. No, he's wrong there. It fell to negative $40 a barrel, which is ridiculous, right? That's what happens when the futures exchange can set the price for the underlying commodity. He says, it's impossible to make any strategic planning for economic development if you do not control prices of basic commodities. Price formation with this new currency should get rid of Western exchanges of commodities. That's exactly what they're doing. 
they're setting the infrastructure and building it methodically, base building, back filling, methodically, to when the stupid price of the West, like negative $40 per barrel of oil, or, or a price that can continue to be suppressed by the commercial banks who, who distort the real value, distort the supply demand fundamentals, distort and, and make it, the real price an illusion to support the agenda of the West, when no one is willing to deliver at those make-believe prices like that, they will flip the switch and say, you know what? Now we're really going to turn up the arbitrage on the Shanghai exchange and the Moscow exchange and the Dubai exchange and all around the world. And here's what gold and silver are really priced at. And they know this. And they are using the Western suppression against us to drain the shelves. Look at India, importing over 400 million ounces of silver. I don't know how much is in the, the total COMEX holdings, 200 and some million. It's almost double what is on COMEX, of which... Probably it's 10 times what is in the registered category. Those are the bars available for sale. These countries know what we're doing. They they are beating us at our own game. And we're too stupid as a country and as a media with no journalistic integrity anywhere to sound the alarm. And we're going to wake up one day to a fact that the COMEX and the LBMA are exposed for what they are, a fractional manipulative scam. And, and that's why you see this slow, methodical accumulation over and over and over and over again. Buy the LME, get all the base metals, settle all of these contracts for grains. Oh, let's make a new grain exchange. So everything that we are doing, setting the prices for the commodities around the globe, they know it. And they're using it to their advantage to accumulate as much as possible before the last idiot will give it away at these make-believe prices. And when that happens, it all changes. It all changes very quickly. So to hear it coming out of, out of the Russians saying, yeah, we know what's going on and we're, we're going to change that at some point, in essence, to get rid of the Western pricing mechanisms in soft commodities, in base metals, and in precious metals. They'll have all three covered. All the commodities, hard, soft, and precious, they will control the price. They will control the production. They will control the shipping lanes. It's all being done methodically, slowly, base building. And we're going to wake up one morning, not your listeners, not the people who I talk to, but the American public will be wake, will wake up to find out that the, the shelves are bare and you can't get it. And the price that we quote is make-believe anyway. So I think that was one of the most telling things that I have ever heard in the last four years related to the BRICS, that if you do not control the prices of base of, of these commodities, then, then it doesn't work. So this new system, price formation with this new currency should get rid of the Western exchanges of commodities. Do you understand how big that is? I think it's huge. And again, base metals, they own the LME. They're doing it with soft commodities. And that's why they're doing the grain exchange, like corn, like wheat, like soybeans. And they're doing it with precious metals too. And it will all it will all end badly and they know it and we don't. And that's the scariest part of all, Chris. And I think that's something that everyone needs to hear. Well, I know what you mean because you, you can see the different steps falling into place. Obviously for gold and silver investors, there's that tendency to want to see that reflected in the gold and silver price yet. I was actually reading a interview from Zoltan Pozar over the weekend and he was mentioning how, and I thought it was, great a great reminder pointing out how these things don't often happen overnight but you see the steps that have gone on whether it was the gold repatriation or seeing the way that gold is being treated now seeing central bank gold buying and to my knowledge i don't think we, i mean we haven't seen any central bank silver buying yet although i was thinking about how if you go what back, about india well, I don't know that I would call that investment demand. Uh, I mean, I think there's people obviously there buying it as an investment demand, although a lot of it seems to be the solar and also a lot of jewelry goes. I'm talking about it in the sense that we think of American investors that are buying silver because inflation or thinking the price is going to go up. Yep. So, you know, I was just thinking about how five or 10 years ago, maybe uh, outside of certain countries in the East, the idea of seeing gold as a store of value or money was not something that most people in the world were considering yet add some pressure on and the different things the economies have gone through over that period of time. And now that's changed. And for the same reason that has changed for gold, those are the reasons that apply to silver and 
how we started off in the U.S. with gold and silver. So I would say gold a step ahead in terms of that process, but which does that guarantee that silver is treated that same way? No, but certainly leaves open the possibility and the things that you're you're saying with the BRICS speak to that possibility, uh, not just with the metals, but a lot of commodities. And I would imagine it won't be, uh, or maybe maybe if there's something announced at some point, then one night it'll feel like an overnight switch. But uh, I appreciate you sharing the each week we're on here and for the last couple of years as you've, you've seen the developments and shared them and allow people to make their own form their own opinion and, and how they see it playing out. But certainly these things are happening and exciting in one sense, a little scary in another sense, perhaps. But I guess we just look at what is happening and just as best as possible. I'm, I'm sure you'll be looking forward to the BRICS meeting and only a couple of months away now, huh? Well, there's 200 meetings between now and the big BRICS meeting. So there'll be meetings every day and just about new developments every day. And you're right. You know, and you said something interesting, you know, some people would say that I've been saying this same thing for two and a half years, three years. I have, I almost four, I get it, but look at the progression, right? So it hasn't been all at once. And that's why I'm, I'm fond of that term logarith logarithmic decay, little by little by little by little by little by little by little, then bang all at once. It's a game of Jenga. So, you know, this has been going on for a long time, 17 years to be exact, that the BRICS have been, you know, what started as a as a as a term that was, I think, coined by a trader, Goldman Sachs or something, has now turned into something very legitimate. The acceleration of this foundation, of this formation in every scope in terms of significance, GDP, human population, military might, you know, uh, commodity share, shipping lanes, everything. And it's being done methodically until it's all at once. And, and so you're right, it will seem like all at once to most people, but to the rest of us who have been hanging on, it will be like, my gosh, that took a long time. And I don't know what it is that breaks it, but I do think that it's true. You can only manipulate a market for a very long period of time extended by pushing it in the direction it's going. And what is different now, Chris, than the years that I've been doing this is that there is way more recognition, not as much by the mainstream, that's still, you know, we're tertiary, if you will, kind of on the side uh, of, of what people see in the mainstream, but certainly by the most well-informed traders in the world, the central banks, the commercial banks, the family offices, the sovereign wealth funds, gold and silver is not lost on them. And, um, I think it will be lost on the majority of the public and a lost opportunity for the majority of the public. Because if you see things being bled dry the way that they are at the highest level of supply, that will have a trickle down effect. And um, it's it's unfortunate that, that it, it's kind of going out this way that the, the mainstream, that the public who really should have an allocation to metals is, is not noticing it because of the price and rhetoric suppression that the in the know people across the globe, I believe, are using against us, using that leverage, using that suppression that we we um, developed and and we employ against us, so that they can slowly and methodically, without raising too much attention, reposition themselves into the things that Zoltan Pozar would say are relevant in this new system. He said it will be a system that will be all about commodities. And that's what this is. So yeah, I think we are heading into that into that world where debt instruments and opaque promises are 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 secondary to commodities and transparency like blockchain. So it is a new world. We are heading in that direction. And the suppression of the West and really the hegemony of the West, I think, is cracking and and it's in its last stages of 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 supremacy. So I mean, I could argue we've lost the hegemony already. We're we still have our supremacy, but how long does that last? At what point does this confidence break? And, uh, you know, when we have our brain dead treasury secretary, you know, gallivanting to Brazil uh, in, a, in a public meeting saying we need to confiscate Russian Forex reserves in Brazil, a member of BRICS. I mean, how close are we to that moment? And I would argue it's getting closer and closer and closer. Well, I hear you. And certainly some of those developments do not paint the rosiest picture, obviously, Countries concerned after they saw the sanctions now 
if we do see the money formally confiscated, it won't leave the best impression, but we will see what happens next. And Andy, uh, I have two notes in wrapping up here. Um, first of which, is there anything on special that people should know about this week in terms of people who are not feeling quite as confident about some of these policies and the directions that things are headed in? Yes, uh, we do have on special this week. Let's see, we have a one ounce 2023 silver Krugerrands at $3.10 over the price of silver. Now we do have some palladium and gold specials, but since this is a silver show, let's just say we have the uh, 2023 South African Krugerrand at $3.10 over the price of silver. We do still have the palladium bars at 119 over, and we have a one ounce backdate, um, one tenth ounce Canadian maple leaf coins at $35 over melt. But I know we like to focus on silver here. So as far as silver is concerned, the 2023 Krugerrand 310 over spot, really, really cool coins. And um, they are IRA eligible, unlike the gold Krugerrand. So I do like them a lot. They're one of the six primary mints. And again, you know, with uh, premiums being where they are, this is, a, I think, as good of a buy on Krugerrands as we've seen in almost four years. Well, appreciate that. And... Second note, and before we wrap up here, a little bit of a more somber note as wanted to pass along. I think a lot of people yeah. saw this back on Friday. Unfortunately, we lost uh, my dear friend, a dear friend to a lot of us, certainly in the gold and silver community, as Jim Forsythe passed away. And uh, very sad news. And I've uh, been thinking a lot and feeling grateful. Did have a chance to meet him in person. See, when we went over uh, by the CFTC back in 2021, got to know him over the past couple of years. He contacted me shortly after the silver squeeze in 2021 and obviously quite an accomplished man. He was in the Air Force, won a seat in the New Hampshire Senate, was involved with Ron Paul's uh, state chair campaign. And then obviously getting very, uh, of, of course, I should mention Citizens for Sound Money, where he really did a lot to educate and try and push ad advocacy of sound money. And so certainly a lot that he did in his time here and also just a really good, kind man. And uh, before I show one other thing here, if you had any thoughts or words about Jim that you'd like to pass along. Yeah, uh, he certainly passed my condolences to his family and his friends. He was a very nice guy and I didn't know him very well, but we did have some conversations and he actually sent me one of the the silver slices he he stamped it put my name engraved in it and uh with an ape on it and you know we're all on the same same side and and um we have had conversations he and I in the past and I um would have I'm remiss that I didn't get to know him a little bit better but he was someone that I admired and actually had ascribed to to work with in terms of offering his he he would take thousand ounce bars and slice them into little little thin sections and then stamp things on it and and I wanted to to rep it. In fact, I even had sent him an email just a few months ago, and we were kind of going back and forth as he was having some health issues. Um, my my sincere condolences, and uh, he's way too young to to have left, but um, um, he was a good guy, and and I'll I'll. Uh, uh, I'll simply just say, I'm sorry to see him go. Yeah, yeah, it really, really was a sad day. And uh, I think a lot of people saw him. Obviously, he was on my show plenty of times and many other shows. And uh, you did mention the Silverback Precious Metals, where at least I think in his last uh, months and years, I think he was doing what he really wanted to be doing and things that made him happy. So going to miss you, Jim. And would add there was a GoFundMe for Jim. This was while he was still trying to recover. This was set up, although Jim did have children survived by his wife. And I'll put the link to this in the description field below if there's people out there who knew Jim and would like to offer support. I'm sure that will be really appreciated in this particular time. And again, just sad news. So God bless you, Jim. And we Thank you for being a good friend and good person on the planet. And um, Andy, with that said, we'll wrap up here. Uh, 
I hate that, man. It's I hate I hate that when good. It's just it's sad. It it is, and it's awful. I'm sorry. Yeah, and perhaps just a good reminder to appreciate what you can and the things that are going well in life and the family and friends that we have around you. And um, certainly I think that's how a lot of people feel about Jim. So that said, we're going to wrap up for today. But Andy, thanks as always. And we'll look forward to catching up with you next week. Yeah, and it'll be uh, next week from uh, from London. So uh, I do have an interesting meeting in London um, that I will want to talk about, whether it be this next week or slightly after, that I think uh, you'll find of interest. But uh, in the meantime, yeah, again, my condolences to to Jim's family and uh, all the best to everyone out there. Go go hug your kids and call someone and tell them you appreciate them and you love them. Like I always tell you, Chris, I love you like a brother and uh, thanks for having me on and look forward to catching up again real soon. Well, love you too, Andy. And thanks for the show today and look forward to next week. Take Likewise. care.